Hello Internet, Seth Skorakowski, and today we'll be taking a tour of the classic Call of Cthulhu scenario, The Haunting. Written by the legendary Sandy Peterson and originally titled The Haunted House, the adventure has been in constant print since the very beginning of the game. Save for the D20 edition, the scenario has always appeared as an introductory adventure for both keepers and players over all these years, and according to Sandy, it was also the very first game of Call of Cthulhu that was ever played, cementing its place in tabletop history. In keeping with that tradition, 7th edition has released the adventure as part of their first quick start guide, which I have links to below. Now, I'm sure some of my regular viewers are thinking at this point, didn't Seth cover this one already? Yes. Yes, I did. Four years ago, when my channel was extremely young, I hadn't really developed a certain review style yet, my equipment was pretty bad, and the audio on it was just frankly terrible. So, like with some of my other early reviews, I've gone ahead and I've taken it down, and I'm going to be redoing it this time a little bit better. Okay, well, it's not deleted, I've just put it out there still, it's just unlisted, so I stuck a link below to it if anybody out there wants to see some of my really early raw stuff. I don't know, man, the first haunting video was my debut, back when I was supposed to be just a one-time gag and I had to tuck my ponytail up underneath my hat. It just feels so weird to be replacing that video. It does, but I'm going to be doing it this time more along the line of how my format for reviews currently works, as well as going to be addressing a few issues that keepers have asked me about over the years, so I can go ahead and add those details to this review to make a much better review than it was the first time around. I'm a member of several online Call of Cthulhu roleplay groups, and with clockwork regularity you'll have new keepers, or soon-to-be keepers, pop in asking, I'm considering Call of Cthulhu. What scenario would you recommend for a first-timer? If not the first, within the first three replies is The Haunting, and there's a good reason why it has been in constant print now for almost 40 years, serving as a rite of passage for so many keepers and players over the course of that time. In addition to its low, low cost of free, the scenario is very elegant in the fact that it is short, playable in only a single session, the scenario says it can be done in three to four hours, and it provides a good taste of what Call of Cthulhu is about while also helping walk new game masters through it. And then, once you're done playing it, both players and keepers get to leave that session with the ability to swap war stories about how their experience was with different gamers of multiple generations that can kind of talk about how they overcame or how they fell to the different obstacles that they found inside the haunting. I've personally run this adventure twice, so what I'm going to do is offer my tips and my suggestions and my criticisms from those experiences, as well as some various things that I've learned since then. So if you're considering Call of Cthulhu, go ahead and download the free quick start rules and enjoy this legendary scenario. And if you're a player that's considering Call of Cthulhu or might have just started playing it and you haven't played this adventure yet, tell your game master to definitely check this one out. But from this moment forward, there will be spoilers. So players, please send your GM this way, but do yourself a favor and stop this video here, lest you have the haunting experience ruined. Alrighty, game masters, let's get this one started. Again. The setup for the adventure is that the player characters are hired to investigate a house after a terrible incident has occurred there. The owner, Mr. Knotts, wants a clean bill of health on the house before he can rent it out to somebody or possibly sell the property. But what no one knows is that the previous owner, a Mr. Walter Corbett, is now an undead thing that's occupying the basement. Players are going to slowly figure this part out as they research and they explore the house, eventually, hopefully, discovering Corbett's lair. Now, as I said, the scenario is meant to walk new keepers into learning Call of Cthulhu, and it offers us a slew of keeper tips and suggestions along the way. We also get nine handouts that the players may or may not discover during the course of the investigation. And while I do love giving out physical clues, the handouts here are pretty plain. However, being such an old and well-loved adventure, there are several fan-made versions that you can find that look like newspaper cutouts or weathered pages, even additional handouts such as Corbett's Journal you can find out there. Many of these can be found at yogsathoth.com. I've stuck a link below to it. Now, you do have to join the website in order to get access to these handouts. A new user approval can take a couple days, so just be warned about that. But with a little Google foo and asking around in the different online communities out there, you can find even more handouts. So the difficulty isn't finding prettier or additional handouts, it's really just narrowing it down to which ones you want to use for your game. 
Also, we get a lot of fan-made art, not just of Corbett and the dagger, but various color maps of the house that you can choose from, just depending on your taste. Now, one handout that does annoy me is Handout 1. It summarizes the setup and the information that the Keeper should roleplay as the landlord, Mr. Knott, offering them this job, and it says that he agrees to reimburse the PCs for their time and trouble and a $25 advance, but it doesn't say what the actual pay amount is, it just says what the advance is. A previous edition of the game had it set at $20 a day, and I kind of like that amount, so I might start that off as $10 or maybe $15 a day, then let the player characters negotiate that up to $20 a day by just doing some back and forth role playing with them. And by the way, they are all going to have to split this amount, so they are going to want to negotiate that up as high as they can go. New keepers who aren't accustomed to what the pay rates were 100 years ago might not know what a reasonable payment is to give the player characters for doing this job. And since this adventure is meant to train new keepers on how to run the game, I feel that that information would have been really useful in order to get them. So uh, go ahead, like I said, set that around $20 a day, but maybe make them negotiate you up to that. However, if one of the characters starts off and let's say they're wealthy and you know 10 or 20 bucks isn't going to really do much for them, that's not enough motivation for them to take this job. Game masters should figure out what will motivate the characters in order to take this job. You know, figure out why Mr. Nut is even asking them to do this job in the first place. Are they old college buddies or war buddies? Are the player characters professional paranormal investigators? Um, are the player characters wanting something from Mr. Nut, like a particular piece of property or some item that he's hesitant to sell them? And in order for him to sell this item or property that they want, he says, hey, you got to do this job for me. Like with many investigative adventures, a game master might need to tailor the hook in order to fit whatever the player character's motivations are. So if it's not going to be money, change this payment to something else that might motivate the player characters, or at least your particular group of Call of Cthulhu investigators. My second criticism of Handout 1, and this is really the bigger one, the handout gives the summary to the player's task and ends with the line, Knowing your jobs, you'll want to conduct some research before you head to the house. You could check out the old newspaper articles at the office of the Boston Globe, head to the Central Library, or go to the Hall of Records. The choice is yours. The purpose of this is to help lead the players who might not be experienced with investigative games toward the investigation. I get that. That is something that a lot of game masters are going to have to teach their players to do. Uh, players are used to things like Dungeons and Dragons. You know, they might just go charging into that house and might not even consider that researching the house beforehand is even an option as something that they can do. However, I don't enjoy just handing all this to them as their options just up front because that can lead to some bad player habits as the players are expecting expecting you to just always give them what all their options are once they start the adventure. It's also a bit impersonal, so this is a role-playing game, so let's go ahead and role-play this part. My solution in order to help my new investigators along was an NPC named Jack. Jack was a detective with a reputation for paranormal experience. Jack was also an alcoholic and a bit down on his luck. The player characters are friends of his and are possibly you know, under his wing as people wanting to learn the ropes of a paranormal investigation. So in return, Jack gets to ride in their car, gets to use their camera because you know his is in the shop, and he gets to lay out sage advice to the player characters because laying out sage advice to them makes him feel important. So when the job came his way, he then tipped off the player characters to it and he said, Hey guys, you asked me to teach you paranormal normal detectiving, well here is your chance. So I'll tell you what, you guys do all the talking and all that, and I'll just hang back here and watch and help you out. Because in his mind, Jack is a teacher. He's also a little bit hungover and doesn't want to do much of the talking himself. Once the player characters agree to the job, if the player characters want to run immediately to the house, Jack says, Whoa, 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 hold your horses there, buddy. I don't want to go charging in there blind. Maybe there's some sort of history there, so we could check out the library, find out if there's any stories, maybe a pattern or something like that. And that could be useful, then we then go to the house. But it ain't going nowhere for the moment. Besides, the guy is paying us 20 bucks a day to do this job, so I don't mind spending a couple extra days in the library if you catch my meaning. That gives the player characters a reason why they should look into researching at first instead of just telling them that they can with no context as to why they should check it out beforehand. Then, during the course of that investigation, they can then figure out that they could go to the Boston Globe or the Hall of Records, and that might have additional information that they could find. And if they don't think of that on their own, Jack can kind of help 
helps steer them that direction. So you're giving yourself the opportunity that you might not have to tell them up front what all their options are. Just let them role play, see if they figure it out. And if they don't figure it out, you've got an NPC there to help point that out to them. Either way, the players are the ones that should be making the rolls to find the information. Don't let the NPC do that part for them. Uh, Jack is going to be there to offer some guidance to them, but he's not there to make their rolls for them. Oh yeah, you can be sure that if I'm going to be splitting my money with them, that they're going to be earning their cut for that. Besides, it ain't like I ain't trying to help them out with the research. It's just that I always seem to conveniently fail my rolls. Now as the players discover information about Corbett, this can then lead them to finding more information at the Boston Globe and the Hall of Records and even at the local police station. They might even end up visiting the asylum where the former tenants are now at. Now at several of these locations, multiple library use checks might be needed in order to find all the information that's available there. Now first, if they're having a librarian or some employee there helping them out, I give them a bonus die to that role because they asked somebody to help them out, so now they're using that other person's expertise in order to help them, so that's how you can reflect that in their skill role. Second, if a player makes the role and they get a hard success, I go ahead and give them two pieces of information at that location just to reflect that they had a really good success. And then if they got an extreme success, I'd give them either three pieces of information or all the information that's available at that particular location. This first can cut down on the number of rolls that you have to do. That way not everybody has to roll and roll and roll if somebody gets a really good success, but it can also show the players the various levels of success that they can have in the game and what those could mean. Next, if the player characters start spending just a little bit too much time at these locations trying to research it beforehand, like they just keep making rolls, hoping they'll be able to find something a little bit more than what they might have already found, remember each roll takes half a day's time in order to complete. So have their employer, Mr. Not, call them up and demand that they hurry this job up. Also, if the player characters fail their library search role, instead of just saying that they don't find this clue that they might need in order to find the next clue and the next clue in order to complete the adventure, go ahead and have them find that clue. Go ahead and give them whatever it was that they were looking for, but now have it be where they've accidentally tipped somebody off about what it is the player characters are looking for. You know, maybe it's a journalist that thinks that maybe there's a story here and they start following the player characters, and that could lead to an interesting situation in the house later on if this reporter maybe breaks into the house after them, you know, maybe startles them or goes wandering down into the basement alone. Maybe one of the cops that was involved in that secret raid on the Chapel of Contemplation finds out that the player characters are snooping into that, and they might get some unwanted attention by the police as a result. You know, maybe the player characters are pulled over and they receive a not-so-subtle threat for some police officer saying maybe they should stop nosing in ancient history and leave well enough alone if they know what's good for them. Or maybe they tip off a cultist, someone who's either part of the old congregation or just very interested in it. Maybe they notice the player characters are researching the cult and Corbett. Maybe they want that mythos tome that no one ever found inside the Chapel of Contemplation. Or maybe they've been trying to discover where Corbett was buried because they want to get that cool magic dagger that he had. Any of those options not only gives away that the player characters might still find the clue to the mystery in order to solve it, but they can still suffer the consequences for failing their role, but it also adds a bit of of an external threat and excitement to the adventure. Now the Chapel of Contemplation, or the former Chapel of Contemplation as it was destroyed during a police raid in 1912, that is an interesting location. Unfortunately, the module doesn't give us any sort of map for it. Once again, fans have come to the rescue and made maps for this location. Now one interesting thing here is a recent piece of graffiti depicting an eye. Now what this is, I have no idea. It emanates a discomforting feeling to all those who gaze upon it. But who it was that painted it is never answered. Maybe there's still active members of this cult out there. Maybe this is a new cult that's moving into that territory. Who knows? And countless keepers over the decades have taken this story scene and expanded it into their own campaigns. The important part here is that the players get a sense of something much larger going on. Secret societies lurking in the shadows. Maybe there's even somebody watching them from afar right now.
After possibly falling through a rotten floor, the player characters are going to discover a hidden room beneath the chapel, and in it they're going to find confirmation that Corbett was buried in the basement of his house, as well as a worm-eaten copy of the Liber of Honest, possibly their first mythos tome. Now this book can be useful, not just for the way that normal mythos tomes can be useful in Call of Cthulhu, but it can cause Corbett to become very interested in any player character that might try to carry that inside his house because he might want to recover that for himself. That, or any cultists that might be watching them from afar, they might be interested in getting that book too. Eventually, either sooner or later, the player characters should enter the Corbett house. We're provided with a map of this place, but for those wanting something a little bit more colorful, again, there is a wide selection of fan-made ones that you can find and use. Many are high resolution and perfect for virtual tabletops. Now, Corbett can pretty much see anything that's going on inside his house. His influence has permeated the entire place, and he probably isn't going to make any significant move against the player characters early on. So if the player characters do decide to come here first, you might just give them a little bit of noises, you know, light creepy stuff here and there, and then they might, you know, get a little creeped out, then leave, research the place, and then come back. However, one thing that might instigate Corbett to start making some aggressive actions against them is if they discover his diaries. Now, two things with these journals. First, they take two full days to read. If the player characters are being paid by the day, they might not have time to read all of this before the adventure is through. And that's perfectly fine. That's a good means for the player characters to at least discover the backstory of what was going on here. So even if they don't learn this information until after the adventure is through, the important part with this is that the player characters have a way that they can learn all this stuff in-game. Next is the spell. The spell Bind Dimensional Shambler can be learned. Now, that will still take 2d6 weeks to learn, meaning that there's no time during the course of this adventure for them to learn it. That's cool. This is a reward, something that they can have on their next adventure. In fact, the spell description doesn't even appear in the Quick Start rules. There's even a little note stating that the spell isn't intended to be used in this adventure. Now, all of that is perfectly fine with me. However, I have heard from multiple keepers over the years because Walter Corbett has this this listed as one of the spells that he knows that the keeper ended up using it and they accidentally wiped out the entire party because they had Corbett cast this spell. So for those keepers out there that might want to try this spell, again, the spell description is not included in the quick start because it's stated that it's not intended to be used during the course of this scenario. But Let's say, for the sake of argument, that you have your own copy of the Keeper's Guide. You have the spell description at your disposal, and you think that Corbett should be able to cast it because he does have that. First, a Dimensional Shambler is bad news. They are terrible. They're pretty much the Demigorgon from Stranger Things. You know, when I watched that show for the first time, I was all like, wow, that thing's a Dimensional Shambler. And anyone that's played the Call of Cthulhu video game can attest to how deadly these monsters are but it's extremely unlikely that Corbett would even cast this spell. First, the spell costs one magic point per 10% chance of success, so spending five magic points gives him only a 50% chance of succeeding at casting. Now, Corbett's enchanted knife might be able to help him out with this. It's never specified if the dagger is of pure elemental metal or how much POW it might have, but maybe you want to make it solid copper or solid iron and give it some POW points, which I think you should. I think it'd be really cool if there was, was an enchanted dagger in order to cast Dimensional Shambler. But regardless of that, the spell is going to drain a lot of magic from Corbett's reserves and take a very long time for him to cast, you know, five minutes per magic point spent. Meaning that if he spends six magic points, giving him a 60% chance of success, it'll take him half an hour to cast this spell, which means that's a half hour that he can't be paying attention to the player characters and using a lot of his magic points that he might need to defend himself from them. And even then, if he takes the time, spends his precious magic points that he has, and he succeeds at it, it still takes another 2d10 minutes for the thing to even show up, and then he has to take another round and another magic point in order to bind it. All of this to say is that it is extremely unlikely that Koba would spend all this time and all this magic trying to summon this monster. So instead of that, just focus on all the other stuff the guy can do, because he is pretty formidable as an opponent. But if you do decide to use this spell, then don't go complaining to nobody that you got a party wipe and the module specifically told you it wasn't intended for this adventure. Anyway, once the player characters are in the house, Corbett is going to watch them and he's going to try to divert them. The first method he's going to do this by is causing some noises to come from the bedroom upstairs. If you have a Jack-type NPC with you in this game, he is definitely going to want to check that out. You guys hearing that? 
I bet there is a vagrant up there. We should go check that out. Once the player characters go up and check out Corbett's bedroom, I had Jack wait outside the room. Hey guys, I'll watch your backs. Make sure no vagrants try to come up on you from behind to try to escape. And then you make things get strange on them. Have the door slam shut and lock, and blood starts pouring from the walls and raining down the ceiling. And then the bed is going to suddenly attack them, trying to knock one of the player characters out the second story window. Now this bed has probably taken out more player characters than any single foe has in Call of Cthulhu. Well, okay, maybe the second most that Dagger might actually have the title for taking out the more player characters than any other foe in Call of Cthulhu, but we'll get to the Dagger in a bit. Now this scene in the room should be intense. If any of the player characters or NPCs are outside in the hallway, you know, they're going to be banging on the door trying to get inside as the player characters that are inside the room are banging on the door trying to get outside the room. And then once it's over, you know, maybe the bed has knocked somebody out the window, the door just suddenly unlocks and swings open freely. You know, now you got an open window and somebody's outside moaning on the ground covered in broken glass. Maybe the blood that was coming out of the ceiling and walls is just completely reabsorbed. It looks completely completely clean now, except for the player character that looks like they've just been completely bathed in blood. Now the module never states how many magic points it takes for Corbett to do all this stuff, and I think it's safe to say that he spends one magic point per effect, such as slamming and holding the door, that's one point, the blood rain, that's another one, the spooky sounds that might have led them up into the room, the attacking bed, so those might all have cost him one point each, but those are going to add up pretty fast. The only other thing that I would add up here is to the bathroom. The upstairs bathtub is said to be full of brackish water, so maybe add that if a player character looks inside this bathtub, maybe they see a mummified face with red glowing eyes staring up at them from the reflection. Just for a moment before a drop of water comes from the faucet, you know, sending ripples along the surface, and that face just kind of dissolves, and now the player character is looking at their own face. In fact, I really do love the idea that you can see Corbett through reflections in the house, so like, all the mirrors in the house, you know, those were all smashed by the previous tenants, or any of the windows that weren't covered by drapes and people might have seen a reflection in it, they smashed those too. So if the player characters look into something, if they can see their reflection, maybe they could see the image of either, you know, somebody moving through a doorway behind them, or, you know, maybe Corbett just kind of leaning in, staring from over their shoulder or something like that. I think that creates a really cool, really spooky effect, and I highly recommend you try that. Once the PCs have finished upstairs, it's time to hit the cellar. Clever player characters who found the article should already suspect that Corbett's body might be buried down here. Now Corbett has a serious line of defense, the floating dagger. But timing this attack for the maximum amount of horror, that can be extremely important. Now, there is no guessing about how the player characters might go about exploring the cellar, but chances are high that they're going to start searching the walls for any secret doors or anything like that, maybe checking the floor. And my most successful run at this adventure when we did this is I had uh, Jack and one of the other player characters, they were trying to get into the coal room door, and Jack said, Hey, check that table back there, see if there's a crowbar, and we will pry this thing open. So a second player character goes across the room, they search one of the tables, they find a crowbar, and when they turn around to come back, the beam of their flashlight hits this dagger that's now floating in the air, kind of positioning itself to hit the PC and the NPC in the back. A spot hidden roll by one of the player characters might be able to, you know, see the shadow that's being projected on the wall around them, or maybe see a, a glint of this rusty metal as it catches in the light. That way, once they see it, they can get a dodge roll in order to avoid it. When finding the knife, if the player character is using flashlight instead of lanterns, mention how this thing is moving in and out of their beam of light. You know, it's hard for them to keep track of. You know, sometimes it just kind of goes off in the shadows and they're trying to search around trying to find it. And that can really ratchet up the horror as you occasionally have this thing just suddenly go missing for a round or two. And then if they drop their flashlight due to uh, taking damage or failing a sanity roll or something like that, have them make a luck roll if they drop their flashlight to see if the bulb breaks and now they've lost that flashlight and it's plunging them even deeper into darkness as now they're there's this flying dagger that's trying to kill them. Eventually, they should break down a hollow wall, face off against some rats, and beyond that, discover Mr. Corbett. It is at this moment, the final fight, that Jack just always seems to fail a sanity check, leaving the player characters to have to fight him alone. But if it looks like the player characters might lose this fight, if it looks like they didn't make good enough rolls, and it looks like it's not going their way, you can have, you know, Jack snap out of it, maybe try to give him a little bit of aid, but it is best if the killing blow is delivered by a player character and not an NPC that just suddenly comes in like the cavalry and saves the day. 
What happens after Corbett dies is completely up to you and your players. But one thing that I think would be pretty cool to add here is in the room with them are some very old horoscope charts. So maybe on these decades old predictions, if the player characters really pay attention to them, they'll see that these make a prediction about this very day being circled as some day that Corbett was going to have to face his biggest threat. While the adventure is written to be a classic Jazz Age adventure set in the 1920s, players have adapted this adventure to fit all sorts of different time periods. My favorite variant that I've ever heard of this as far as putting this in a different time period is making it a modern day setting where the player characters are with some sort of reality TV show ghost hunting series. And you know, I don't know why, but this one just really speaks to me as being a lot of fun. Hey everybody and welcome to Ghost Trackers. I'm your host Jack and this week we're checking out the old Corbett house. We sensed a psychic vibration down in the basement. We're hoping that we can make contact with- <coughs> Overall, the haunting is a spectacular adventure. It's perfect for new players and new keepers to kind of get their feet wet and figure out what Call of Cthulhu is all about. Also, being cheap as free makes it a very easy choice for people that are willing to try out Call of Cthulhu without making any financial commitment to it. So keepers, if you have not run this adventure, I strongly suggest that you check this out and put your players through it. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews and how-tos, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, gamers, you have a great day. You know, the other two scenarios that you list in your top three introductory Call of Cthulhu adventures, Dead Light and Edge of Darkness, both of those, you did a remake video as well. And with both of those, shortly after you did the remake, Chaosium updated the scenario with all new art and different stuff like that. So my money is that Chaosium is going to be updating the haunting on you really soon. Because you know what? That's their tradition. Yeah, you guys, uh, you guys handle the talking. I'll just watch and help you along if you need anything, all right?